Hello, Daniel Stillman. There he is. Welcome. What's up? How's it going? <laughs> Thanks for having me here. I'm really Thank excited. You so much. I'm also extra excited about your shirt. Can we? We didn't get a chance to talk about it. It's kind of legit. The sparkles are are really yeah. That's amazing. You didn't tell us. You didn't tell me we'd be dressing up. I just wore. <laughs> <laughs> it's that dress code. What to wear? What to show? Yeah. Yeah. No, amazing to have you on the show. I want to give a shout out to everyone. Um, and thank you to anyone also that has joined us live in the conversation this morning. Um, so we will go out as usual for questions. Um, so if you've got a question for Daniel, please don't hesitate to key that into the Q and A section. Um, and we'll get to that at some point. But I'm going to give you a really quick introduction. And I have a sneaky feeling, Daniel, we're going to be able to go quite deep, quite quick, because there are so many things that I really want to cover with you in this time that we've got this morning. But a little yeah. bit, Daniel. So he designs conversations for a living. Yes. Um, but you do too, by the way. Not to interrupt you, but like, that's what everyone does. That's my, that's what I propose is that that's what everyone does. That is it. It insists that we do too, right? I, and that's yeah, I insist that you do too. <laughs> <laughs> He's the author of Good Talk, um, which I've had the pleasure of reading uh, everything that's available around the book, but I highly recommend this. Let's dive into that. He's the author of Good Talk, which is How to Design Conversations That Matter, a handbook for leaders to create change. But you're also an independent design facilitator and the author of the super, super popular, yeah. uh, The Conversation Factory, which a few people who've actually come on this show have also mentioned as an episode, uh, show that other people need to get on. So congratulations. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So tell us, Daniel, what are the conversations <laughs> you should be having but probably not? Wow. Well, so I wouldn't should on you. I would definitely not tell you what conversations you should be having, but I'll say for myself, when I started investigating this idea of designing conversations, what kind of snuck up on me, I started in design thinking and innovation and I was like facilitating workshops and meetings and stakeholder engagements. And the idea of those experiences as conversations worthy of designing it's actually an idea I learned in Australia. I was working with a group called Second Road in Sydney for a couple of months. And that's how, what they called their facilitation practice. And when I first heard them say that, I was like, uh, that's kind of douchey. Like, what does that even mean? You're not designers and how do you design a conversation? But for me, I had this arc of going from industrial design to user experience design to service design. And I was like, well, oh, maybe there's this Maybe conversations are a thing. Maybe that's the next type of design. And certainly no one teaches you that in design school. And I don't know how, if they teach it in business school, like how to design meetings, workshops, projects. Like those are, you know, those are really important conversations to design if you're going to be an effective uh, person in the working world. But when I started to realize that, and maybe you've, you've realized this too, Fiona, like there's a difference like when you have two people in a meeting or three or four or five, and then, and then the client says, well, actually there'll be 15 people. Oh, actually, no, there's going to be 25. And then you start to like, your heart starts to pitter patter. There's this line from um, the princess bride, which is in the book where the, I don't know if you've seen the movie. Yes. Uh, there's the, the scene between Fezzik and the man in black, where they talk about uh, fighting one-on-one -on -one versus fighting crowds yes. and there are different techniques, but it's still fighting. Right. So I think I realized conversations have size. There's big conversations and I was really good at, okay, well, okay, well, we have a hundred people and we want to take them through a two hour innovation thing. Like, cool. No problem. Actually another 50. Fine. There's no real difference. I can only totally manage it. But then if you zip down in size and you go down to the conversation that you have when there's no one else in the room, mm -hmm. that's just the conversation with yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that's kind of the foundation of all the other ones. I, 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 Maybe I'm the only one, but I've got a bunch of voices in my head and not all of them are that nice to me. Some of them are really nice to me. And then sometimes they're really mean to me and sometimes they're talking at the same time. And so self-talk and managing self-talk, that's a conversation that most people would rather not have. We either, um, it's like when your mother or your father or aunt or uncle or whoever would berate you like, oh, you 
you know, you're, you're always such and so. You never blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, you're right. Or you go, no, you're wrong. I'm not like that at all, mom. Right? So it's either one or the other. It's not like, well, that's so interesting. Tell me more about that. Well, what evidence do you have? Like, let's, let's really get it all out on the table. And let's really dig into this. So we never actually have a conversation with ourselves. It's usually just uh, an order and that we follow or uh, resistance to another uh, prompting that we're having in ourselves. So the idea of actually having a conversation with yourself, if there's one conversation that everyone should have that they are probably not, it's spending some time talking with yourself, mm. not to yourself, with yourself. <laughs> So good, so much in that as well. But I mean, we so we probably are we are having conversations with ourselves, but yeah. not consciously. We're not consciously having conversations with ourselves. They're just yeah. maybe right. arguments. So this is like the design aspect. Like how are we designing it? And so there was an example in the book where this woman would leave herself voice messages. She would go walk her dog and she would call herself and then be like, oh, Fiona, I'm just having trouble with this, this, and this, and this, and this. And I, I, you know, she would just talk it out. And then if she wanted to, she could listen to the message later. And we all know we're better at solving other people's problems than we are solving our own. So this basically separates the conversation out and creates a, a new interface for the dialogue. And so this is something that popped out in the, in the research for the book. It's like conversations have a place. Like we're having this conversation here in Zoom. And this conversation enables certain things and it disables certain things. And having a conversation with herself on the phone is different than sitting down and journaling, mm. right? But she got something out of that process of just, just talking it out is like level one. Like she said what was on her mind. And then it's like, oh, listening to it again. And then you get another crack at like, oh, wow, wow. Is, that's, is that really how I sound when I'm, I'm really complaining a lot? I should really do something about that. And so I think it's an interesting iterative process of listening to yourself. So that's, it's just time well spent. I don't care if it's journaling or going for a walk and talking to yourself or, you know, meditating and not talking to yourself. Like we don't actually spend enough time in silence with ourselves. <laughs> that's not a skill that most people have. Like, you know, I had an old friend who told me years ago that the mark of a good relationship was the ability for the couple to be together and not talk. Mm. And I've definitely taken that to heart. It's a really amazing thing to be able to have that. And wouldn't that be nice to be able to have that with yourself? Just to go for a lovely walk with yourself and just enjoy the scenery and not be playing the tape, as we like to call it, right? There'd be a few couples who might have been challenged by that at the moment, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you want to listen to Esther Perel's podcast, she's interviewing people. I can't imagine what it would be like to be on the brink of divorce at this time. And I'm really sorry if that's where you're at. My heart goes out to you. It's, you know, it's hard enough, but at least you had a place to go to get away from it. And now there's like kind of no escape uh, from, from the conversation. Yeah, scary byproduct to all of this. Yeah. Um, so, so the key to better relationships is saying step one is actually conversations with yourself. Oh yeah, man! You got to get right with yourself. One hundred percent. I told you we were going to go deep, quick. I knew that that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I want to drill a little bit more into what got you here. So you mentioned yeah. you know, it was yeah. that journey through graduating industrial design, then you moved into actually designing physical products and services, and then it's yep. became this. Okay, design is actually a conversation, and then now you've written the book, literally on it. Tell us, tell us more. Well, I mean, I, when, I, when I met that team at Second Road, this was like 2015, mm -hmm. late 2015. And I had just been, um, I had just been bought out of my business. Uh, and so I was like having a bit of a wander mm -hmm. and a wonder, you know, I was having, this is what you do. People go walk about, we come to Australia. That's, <laughs> that's what we, people come to, to find themselves. And so I was, I was just really looking for how to define what, what work I did and the value I had. And these, it's, it's strange that these two words, conversation design really did just, I was like, what does it even mean? And I remember having, I sat down and I did four interviews uh, with four really wonderful people. They wound up, that became the seed for the podcast, but I didn't actually start the podcast for another year because I was like, I don't know. I wasn't ready yet. Like the egg wasn't hatched. 
but I remember having those interviews uh, with um, my friend Dave Gray, who was nice enough to write a, a note for the front of the book uh, and is the author of Game Storming, co-author of Game Storming and also Liminal Thinking, two wonderful books. And uh, my friend Abby Covert, who wrote How to Make Sense of Any Mess, which if you haven't read is like a wonderful, wonderful book. It's it's a it's a it's a general interest book about information architecture and it's a book that was designed and i watched her design it i was there while she was turning it from slides to a card deck from card deck to index cards from index cards to a children's book she was like what do, you know she, she tried it every way till sunday and so i watched her go through this process and so i i went to these people who i knew and respected and i was like well, what when i when i say these two words conversation design you tell me back what it means to you and I, everything that I heard just really just started my brain on a pickle. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I guess like all of 2016 was like, well, how do we design conversations and where do we design conversations? And, and I think the primary way that I'd been designing conversations was design thinking. Design thinking was like the double diamond, yeah. right? And I, I, I don't know if you remember where and when you were, when somebody like drew the double diamond for you. But you're like, yeah, it's like remembering where you were when you first heard like, you know, the Beatles or something. You're like, oh my God, I knew it was like, if you asked my mother, she'd be like, the world changed. I knew there was something different about them, right? The, the clouds parted. And, uh, but it really is like that. When somebody gives you a new model or a new framework, it is in, in essence a design for a conversation. It's a new story and story and narrative is a component of conversations and how we how we communicate we we exchange stories in conversation and so when somebody brings a powerful story and say let's go what would it be like imagine if at the end of this project we delivered on amazing discoveries that we defined and developed solution powerful solutions to is that something you'd like to pay six figures for and they go yes yes i would and i remember the realization we're like wow design thinking allows me to uh, to, to do something they never taught me in design school, which is frame the entire conversation and uh, pause it at specific intervals and uh, invoice my client. How powerful is that, <laughs> right? So there's going to be four phases. There will be four invoices. There'll be four reports. And you're, it's, it's, it gives you power, right? So instead of going through the, the squiggle, you know, you know, I'm sure you know the squiggle drawing of of creativity where you're like okay so we're just going to be going from unknown to known and uh i don't know how long it's going to take and uh can you just like i'll, I'll just send you invoices as we go how does that <laughs> how, how does that work for you and and that can work i know people who are like look 10k month retainer and we'll just work it out until we work it out and god bless you some of us have to uh scope time and cost against you know, value yeah. delivered and, and deliver against that. So for me, I think the double diamond or like the three-way Venn diagram of viable, feasible, and Desire. de desirable. Thank you. Oh my God. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, what's confusing me is that Tendai Vicky, who I, I just had on my podcast, mm -hmm. uses a, a four-way Venn diagram, which blew my mind. The fourth circle was adaptable. Oh. And, I'd and, and I was like, whoa. Like, is it adaptable to uh, changes? And this is a great conversation. It frames a conversation with your clients where you say, well, okay, so you've got desirability, you've got feasibility and viability. What portion of your current portfolio is resilient to uh, major changes in the global landscape? Mm. Right. And they go, well, gee, I don't know. Well, you go, cool. Well, let's have that conversation. Let's line up what your current innovation initiatives are and see which one of them are, which one of them is built on your current business model and which ones are built on untested or new business models. And obviously strategizers entire thing is business model innovation. So not for nothing, that fourth circle speaks very well to their capabilities. Good job, Alex. Foster Walter, <laughs> like kudos to you. Um, company out now. So, yeah, and like that extra circle, like just it asks a question yeah. that feeds into their capability. Yeah. And I think that's that's an amazingly powerful way of designing a conversation. Right. And so that that to me is like that journey of like 
having a framework, having a design for the conversation can help you navigate difficult terrain. Mm. And that's, you know, you're talking about the leading conversations and being able to lead conversations. I want to get um, more specifically as well into yeah. themselves inside organisations. So in the book, you've got a quote from Ed Catmull from Pixar, who also wrote yeah. Creativity. Um, and it is, to paraphrase, he's saying, actually, I'll just quote, if there is more <laughs> truth in the hallways than in meetings, you have a problem. If you can't talk about something in the hallways, you have a bigger problem. Yeah, that, that last sentence was mine. I thought that was very clever of me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what, like, what are the conversations, if for the leaders that are listening, what are those yeah. conversations that leaders should be having all the time and even another layer, you know, especially now? Yeah, well, so there's actually a framework I just learned from a friend of mine uh, who's a really, really amazing coach. And he talks about, you know, have you ever heard of the Eisenhower matrix? There's, it's this classic. So there's this, um, I actually learned this framework initially from Randy Pausch wrote this. He did this amazing speech. He was dying of pancreatic cancer. He was a professor at university of Virginia and he gave this Virginia, you, you Virginia had this last lecture series where professors would give their putative last lecture. Like if you, if this was your last lecture, what would you talk about? He gave his literally his last lecture because he was going to pancreatic cancer is incredible. There's basically, it's one of the worst types of cancer to get totally untreatable. And he wound up giving this talk and it went super viral at the time. He wound up on Oprah. He wrote a book, uh, totally Google the watch the talk. It's absolutely beautiful. It's about how to really achieve your childhood dreams. And he also does another talk on time management and he gave it while he was dying. Mm. So I'm just going to let that soak in. Like hearing a dying man talk to you about time management, it really brings it home. And he had this framework and everyone loves a good two by two. Uh, There's things that you have to do that are due now and things that you have to do that are due later. And there are things that are um, super important And then you have things that are like, maybe not so important, right? Yeah. And so if we were to look at this quadrant and I were to ask you, um, what is the most important quadrant? Stuff that's due now that's important, stuff that's due now and unimportant, stuff that's due later and unimportant, or stuff that's due later than important. What is quadrant number one that Fiona should be spending most of her time on? Do, do. And, and maybe we can get anybody who's watching at home to tell us what's quadrant number one. Well, here, let's try this. What's the noun important? But then so noun, you, noun but important. If, but if you do the noun important, then you're just putting, you know, that could just be putting out fires. That could just be task-related stuff. So yes. But it's like something you think you should put, you know, it's probably... Yeah. So up, what's the know. least important quadrant? Let's, let's do that. What's definitely the least important quadrant? Not important, do now. <laughs> <laughs> Not important and do now, right? Yeah, so like you slipped it, but, but when, if we think about what's normal, I think we could, I generally think that what's later and unimportant is definitely priority number four easy to say that stuff that is not so important and do later, it's like move it to the bottom of your to-do list. But I agree with you 100%. A lot of us spend a lot of our time dealing with stuff that's super important and do really and do now. I think it is absolutely true that we should be spending more time thinking about stuff that's important and do later before it comes in to the now. Yeah. Right. And so whenever I'm really overwhelmed, I, I draw this two by two for myself and I take everything I've got to do and I stick it in there and I just do a little bit of these two quadrants. Yeah. And I think for leaders, having this conversation with themselves and their teams mm. is critical because what this is, is the difference between being reactive and proactive. Mm. So this reactive is like, I'm, and of course, a lot of us are doing stuff that's super unimportant and somehow do now. Fiona, did you fill out paperwork X, Y, and Z? You're like, no, I didn't. Well, 
can you get someone else to sign that? No, no, you're the only one who can sign it. And that's when you start to realize like, oh my God, I'm the bottleneck here. Okay, well, let's have a conversation about how to make sure that stuff that's due now and unimportant does never comes on my desk. Mm -hmm. Let's have that conversation about not just being reactive and not just being proactive, right? But actually trying to like, what's past proactive for us? How can we be, uh, I don't know, strategic mm -hmm. <laughs> and make sure that like, we're not just being opportunistic and being proactive uh, about like what's, what's emerging Mm -hmm. my friend this my friend robert who talks about this he says like being proactive is still dealing with the future yeah i'm sorry dealing with the past like being proactive and being reactive is still based on like what's coming down the pipe whereas being strategic is building your own future and so those are the like at least have this conversation with your team about where are we spending most of our time and why and where would we like to be spending more of our time and how might we make more time for long-term important thinking, which is so hard to do. Like wow. it's super hard. Wow. You know, but it's so cool there that you even like a great example of using a model to frame the conversation. So some yeah. take people in and bring them back. But again, like going even deeper on that, like so hard at the moment, particularly for leaders yeah ambiguity and you know all of this good stuff and you know we we kind of had a saying here where we were like you know this is not a drill <laughs> this is stuff yeah for so long it's here now but making decisions on what is the most important thing you know when everything is so uncertain and maybe even leaders above them can't be crystal clear on what the strategy yeah. is or where we're going because of the way that things sit it right. It seems that way. But I, I was talking to somebody about this too, where they were like, what are you seeing coming down the pipe? Like, what are you like, does Daniel have some crystal ball knowledge? Mm -hmm. And I guess I treat it like fashion. Mm -hmm. um, that shirt will never go out of style, Fiona. <laughs> somebody may tell you, girl, sparkles and sequins are so last season. And you, to that, you say, just crawl up, die, climb into a hole. I love these sparkles. They work for me. I love the colors. They say something about who I am. And I will, that's when buying a piece of clothing is an investment, mm. right? You're like, these leather pants are going to be good forever, right? <laughs> or me. not. You're like, yeah, <laughs> maybe not. That's why it's good to shop with a friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, but similarly, what I was pushing back on this friend who was asking me for advice, I was like, well, well what is true to your purpose? Yeah. What do you really want to create in the world? Why are you doing what you're doing? And, you know, instead of trying to anticipate where the market is going and then maybe not wanting to offer where, like, is that, is that what you want to offer? Like, are you in business to be in business? Mm -hmm. I, I think if, if, for me, I'm kind of a solopreneur. And, and so to me, it's product, market, team fit and on the team. So it's like, if I don't like doing it and I'm not having fun doing it, I'm not going to do it. Um, and I may not be the right person to bring that thing. So if I see, even if we saw the future, it may not be our, ours to bring into, into life. So I think I wish I would love for companies to be able to say to themselves, why do we really exist? Mm -hmm. Right? What is our true purpose? And presumably they should still be able to find a way to deliver that purpose. Even in this. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think people are sort of waiting to know rather than just like going with what you've got. Mm -hmm. But, but that's a, that's a, there's a design for that conversation too, right? This is Jeff Bezos talks about this. Like if you wait until a hundred percent certainty, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's like make decisions at 70% and decide, is this a decision that is a reversible decision or a reversible decision? is this having, is this like going on vacation or is this having a kid? Like those are two really different types of choices. Um, you can, <laughs> they're, they're, they're both, they're both reversible. One's a little bit harder to reverse, you know, at, at various stages. Experimentation comes in as well. Yeah, so. very much so. This is the right time for that. But I love the way that you're bringing that back to, is this our purpose and do I really want to do it? You know, is it doing something for the sake of it? Are we just staying in business for, to be in business um, yeah. at, at any cost? Or is, yeah. it, you know, is this a time for us to use the pause, the pause, yeah. pause to kind of figure some stuff out that maybe we didn't have? 
so this is an interesting point. What's, what's coming up for me is um, something in the book, the, the conversation operating system, these, these nine elements that I feel are easier to grip and hold if you want to steer the conversation or if you want to shift the conversation. And one of them is cadence. So the ability to actually pause on purpose is, is a skill that you can develop, right? And the ability to sprint on purpose is a skill you can develop, right? And so I think there's a lot of talk right now or, and has been for a while about sprinting. And I, I, Jake is a talented guy. I, I love him to pieces and it's a great book. Sprinting is not the solution for everything. Going faster is not the solution if you don't know where you're going. A sprint can actually help you decide where you're going, right? But sometimes a group just needs to pause on purpose, right? And say, where are we now, right? And I don't even think Jake would say the sprint. I think it's actually a lot of other people who've taken the book and said, this fixes everything. And it doesn't. You, you still have to be able to say, where are we and what do we want? Why does this matter? And who should we involve? That's not necessarily a, a sprint question, that's like a marination question. And that's being, that's changing the pace, the cadence of the dialogue on purpose. Mm -hmm. I think companies are stuck in like one speed. You know, it's either like there, it's all fast, like move fast and break things. And they're like, Oh God, yeah. wait a minute. Don't, don't move fast and break things like move reasonably quick and don't break anything. Can, can, you know, you can't put that on a t-shirt, but that's, that's what, and then companies say, and nobody actually has as their motto, like move really slowly and don't screw up. But that's clearly written on the manual somewhere for some, for some companies like don't, don't mess up because you will get fired if you screw it up. So like everyone got that message. And so nobody wants to try anything. And so the entrepreneurs have definitely got the message uh, write a 36 page business plan and then you get to waste two million dollars <laughs> I'm pretty sure Facebook even, even corrected that didn't he didn't he go around and write on the posters in Facebook you know yeah. slow down and fix your shit <laughs> yeah yeah exactly totally but I, I wonder in that because it's so it'd be so interesting to see if we can if we can bring that ability to pause with us more intentionally yeah. after this, because it's been put on us, you know, we, we all know. I hope so. And it's whether we can learn that lesson to bring that forward. And it's, you yeah. even saying that is making me think about a really interesting topic in your book around patterns. Um, mm. About seeing, you know, as humans, we are sense making machines. Yeah. We see all the patterns that are around us and what you've just done there is talk about like that's a pattern that's going on out there in the world about sprint or pause. There's something mm. that's not even in this conversation around the cadence of the way that we exchange and, and the things that that does. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, what understanding patterns can unlock to be yeah. powerful in conversation. Well, I think this is something that leaders do, right? This is something that facilitators and leaders do, which is noticing and naming. Mm -hmm. And it's really powerful because it, it's a double-edged sword. If you say to somebody, um, you, you, you seem angry, mm -hmm. right? You're actually noticing some signals about them and then you're naming it. And when you say to somebody, you seem upset, like you seem angry, like usually somebody rejects that naming, mm. right? I don't think when, when you say to somebody, honey, you look tired. Are you okay? That, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, thanks. thanks. I'm fine. <clears throat> that doesn't always work so well. And so this is asking versus telling. Telling is really powerful. Like naming something and saying, this is what it is mm. can be powerful if you're in a group and nobody's, you know, calling out the elephant as it were. Mm. If you say, I'm feeling some tension in the room. Can we talk about that? Mm. That's actually asking about what's happening, but it's also, it is naming it, but it's naming it in a super gentle way. Mm. And so this is something else I, I, I write a little bit about in the book, this quadrants of asking and telling versus problem and solution and uh, David Rock, draws those axes in his book, Quiet Leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think that upper quadrant of asking about problems is 
what I would call the gentle quadrant. And that is a really powerful leadership skill to say what's happening in the room to, but in a way that is welcoming, that is, in, it is inviting and invitational to say like, can we talk about what I'm experiencing and is anybody else experiencing that? That is, that draws a circle, it draws a boundary. And that is an invitation for everyone to say like, I'm feeling it too. No, actually I'm not feeling it. Okay, cool. So then now what? Now we've started to draw out the polarities in the room. And I think a lot of the times we're afraid to name things because we're afraid that the answer is no or um, yes. It's like, I'm getting the sense that we're not working anymore, <laughs> right? Like I've been thinking about breaking up with you. Are you thinking about breaking up with me? Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Like, can we just get on with the, the next conversation now? This has definitely happened to me in the past where I'm like, oh my God, they are totally going to fire me. And then they call me into the room. So I'm like, I'm miserable here. I am not enjoying this experience. And I'm like, God, I just hope they fire me. And they call, call me into the room. They're like, so this isn't working out. I'm like, yes, thank you so much for saying it. Now we can just talk about, you know, everything, the rest of our lives. That's so great. I think we're always afraid, many of us, I'll use I statements, it can be scary to bring up difficult conversations, quote unquote, difficult conversations. It's only difficult because we don't want to hear the answer and we don't know how to do the next step. But I think if we think all the steps through, then we can say, okay, well, so what's the cost of not doing it? What's mm -hmm. the cost of doing it? Uh, let's do it. <laughs> That's usually the conversation I have with myself. Um, I'm not even sure what the question was at this point, but <laughs> you tell me, am I getting closer? <laughs> Is this yeah. what you're looking for? <laughs> It's down to, um, you know, being able to see the patterns. The example that you gave. Yes, well, yes. Um, okay, cool. Thank you for bringing me back. Boris uh, talks about when he was playing chess for years. And yeah, yeah, yeah. At one point in time, he really started to see the patterns. and See the patterns. The thing that's going on. You know, I mean, and you've touched on it there. It's like it's that humbling thing of, you know, probably or even playing out a few scenarios in your head rather yeah. than just being afraid of that wide open expanse because it's you know and the experiences that we've had with that probably since we're young are things yeah. like you know no one wants to hear as you say again in the book we have to talk yeah <laughs> is that well, everything that comes after is frightening but yeah stopping us having better conversations yeah and so pattern making is an energy saving device i think as we grow and as we adults and i'm sure you've had this experience right when you see the way things usually go, you can save energy by moving in the direction that things tend to go, yeah. right? It has to, you know, that's what makes us better at client management or project management or relationship management in general. But I think the minus is that if you only see the patterns, then you'd never uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. and this, is, this is why I think sometimes big companies hire small agencies, Right? It's, it's their lack of experience. They don't have blinders on. They want to investigate all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then the company says, no, we've tried all that. That'll never work. And so then you're like, well, why are you spending money here? Which is a whole other question. But sometimes those unexpected left field things work. And so patterns and living by patterns is so great and helpful and efficient. Having the double diamond is better than not having the double diamond. But thinking that everything, every innovation project is the double diamond is really hampering. It means that you never try something new. It means that you're not. So I think there has to be that yin and yang of, of patterning and clarity and seeing the matrix, like Forrest Whitaker's talking, like actually seeing the chess board and knowing what all the possibilities are. But it doesn't replace like trying something new and taking a risk and, um, playing against yourself. Like maybe this, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something else that can happen. So I think there's, it's, I don't want somebody to invest hundred percent in uh, let's have all the right patterns and only play by the pattern book. And let's have the, cause I think people want the rule book, mm. but if the rule book worked hundred percent of the time, then everybody would be doing it. I presume. Yeah. Um, so sometimes the rules don't work, which is why it's good to break the rules. And that's usually what happens. Have you ever read The Coaching Habit? Uh, it's one of my favorite books about coach. Are you a Coaching Habit fan? It's a wonderful <laughs> book. Yeah. Um, do we have a guest who's coming on the show? Somebody's connecting. Oh, 
Greek is kind of Greek is showing up twice. <laughs> um, he talks about like coaching to the right way of serving, and then this idea that like some of the greats served the wrong way, and now it's the right way. Mm. I just love this idea of like conventional wisdom. If conventional wisdom was always true, if patterns were always true, then there would be no hope for growth or innovation or development. So occasionally we just have to hope that conventional wisdom is going to get turned on its head yeah. uh, and we could do it. Why not? Yeah. And now is the time as well. Yeah. I think so I thought we might have a question coming in as well. Oh, there's a chat. Oh, yes. There you go. Yeah. Um, but we will, we'll keep going. So just a reminder as well, don't forget to send in your questions if you've got one. Um, I want to, can we talk a little bit about, some of the, the organizational dynamics that are uh, another really cool example that you give is the Dr. Seuss mm. Dax. Talk uh. us that sort of story because that really resonated with, you know, I think how, you know, unintentionally so many people, especially sometimes when you're leading in an organization, you can become a bit of a Zach. Talk to us about Yeah. I Thank love you. that you like... <laughs> <laughs> like loved that story. Did you read that that story when you were a kid? Did you, oh, did you... that's what I never, I never heard of. So that it was, was yeah. it was a shorter one in in a compendium yeah. of the Zacks, and and there is an animated version on YouTube if you want to watch it. And it's it's a uh, it's it's kind of ironic, mm -hmm. and it actually kind of plays into this question about patterning. Yeah, because if somebody's lived their life, these two creatures meet. One goes east, and one goes west. And they, they meet in the middle and uh, they literally meet head on. Mm. And one says, well, I only go east. And the other one's like, I only go west. I don't go north or south. I don't go in any other direction. And so they literally cannot move in any other direction because they are stuck. And I, I've definitely been in meetings like that where everyone's got their way that they think it's supposed to go. And they're, in, and they're fundamentally incompatible. And so the question is like, well, what are we going to do? How do we break out of this pattern? Who's going to give, right? And this, this is why people read about negotiation because they think negotiation is a um, uh, win-lose game. And so I need to figure out how to like position myself and my argument and I have to get a deck so that I can like come on with facts and then when have facts ever convinced anybody of anything, right? If facts were, were useful in this world, we would have a very, very different world. We, we're all allowed our own facts now. Mm. And also data doesn't show anything. Yeah. People show stuff with data. Yeah. And so data is just there. It does, nobody knows what it means. And so we're all telling different stories with the data. And so we're just stuck. And so there's, you know, you got this, the, got one Zax who's like, uh, we profit over planet <laughs> and the other Zach's is like, no planet over profit. And how are those two people even supposed to have a conversation? Right. Until somebody shows them a new way of, well, maybe it's possible to do both. Right. I, I, my, my, I'm pointing to the wall because on the other side of the wall is my fiance, Janet, who just finished her MBA in sustainability. And She's such a do-gooder, like, dreamer. She really believes. <laughs> I think it's a, the hardest thing in the world. Like, how can we design regenerative businesses? Can we actually have profit and planet? I don't know, but it's a great question. I'm glad she's asking it. You know, and getting those two people in the room who, have, who are at, literally at loggerheads, how do we break the log jam? It's nice to think that we could potentially flip the whole conversation on its head. But it's only possible if people are willing to come to the conversation, right? Yeah. It's non-trivial. Can you give us, how would you tackle something like that? I mean, it doesn't have to be bad examples. So to yeah. sustainability, but like, you know, what do you do? Because this, this happens all the time. Yes. You know, you know, it's not, it's, sometimes it's a case of another example that you give, but actually a client where it's, they don't even think it's possible to get those people in a room. So it's yes. versus design. Right. So you don't even ask. <laughs> exactly. We don't even ask because we know yeah. that never, they would never collaborate. They would never work together. 
except for those people who are listening and thinking, like, if I cannot get these two groups together, I don't know another way. Like, what are yeah. some techniques that you play with to get around something? There's only one technique that works. This is well documented. It's called listening. Well, actually, there's two techniques. There's listening and then caring. Uh, so th there's a book called Humble Inquiry by Ed Schein. Uh, I'm working my way through it slowly. I'm, I'm really bad at reading these days. I'm going to be honest. The ask-tell spectrum in David Rock's formula, I don't know if it came from Ed Schein or if it's just out there in the ether, asking versus telling. Ed Schein calls asking, true asking, humble inquiry. And I have to give you, I have to tell you the truth. Like my, my, my publicist for the book uh, offered me a spot on daytime radio for a conservative radio program, like super duper conservative, like claims he's friends with my president, Donald J. Trump, and that he speaks. He's the, he's the, he's the voice of the deplorables. And I showed this to my friends. I'm like, should I go on the show? And they were like, yes, if only for this, like the story. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it wound up not happening. And I'm glad because I was like, I don't know if I can just go on there and talk about my book. And just like, that feels like collusion to me. That feels like making a deal with the devil and not being like, so tell me, do you believe in climate science? Right? <laughs> tell me more about uh, how vaccines uh, mm -hmm. harm our children. Tell me, tell me more about why it's okay for the president of the United States to not wear a face mask. Mm -hmm. I am not coming to that conversation with an ounce of humble inquiry. I am coming as an ex of mine used to say loaded for bear, right? I am, we're, we're hunting bear today and I've, and I've got all my, my ammunition with me. Mm -hmm. That is never going to work. That is not going to change anybody's mind it would be really satisfying for me and my friends. They would love listening to that interview. But here's the thing, I would probably get demolished by that guy because I would be coming from a place of passion and fighting him with facts and he would come with his other facts. And there's the whataboutism and Obama did that, uh, something else that's probably worse in his mind. And then we're having the conversation. There's no end to that. But it is possible. And there's actually in the interview I have with Dave Gray, he, I ask him this very question. He goes through it. He says, like, he knows people who, um, their, your entire life depends on the truths you hold dearly. And the only way to potentially dismantle it is to keep asking people honest and real questions. Socrates taught this. Like, if you ask people enough questions, he said the unexamined, is, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. And the flip side of that is that most people are living lives that are not fully examined. Most people have some fundamental assumptions on which everything is built. So this is the problem. Because if I tell you the secret, it's like if you, if you love and care enough to ask really honest and interesting questions, eventually you might be able to find an assumption that is completely untenable and then you could just topple them over and then win. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the secret is asking a lot of really good questions. But what might happen is you might actually change your mind. You might actually discover something that is good in their opinion. You have to be willing to find out what's good in it. They are loving something. They are loving something. Donald J. Trump is loving something. It is hard to look at that man and feel love, but I can twist my brain around the idea that he is loving something. And if I can figure out what he's loving and what he's choosing, I can at least empathize and understand where he's coming from. And then there might be terms of not debate, but conversation. Here's the problem though. I can't guarantee that he's that curious about my life. Right. There's a quote in the, in the book from James Baldwin which I always misquote, but it's like, we can't have a conversation if you fundamentally question my humanity, right? So like a black man can't have a conversation with a white supremacist and smile mm. because underneath it is a fundamental dishonesty where the, the man of color is being dishonest with themselves to pretend that it's okay to have that, that opinion. Mm. And 
the white supremacist is, is literally questioning the humanity of the other person. It's really hard to have a conversation in that, in that instance. Then the, all bets are off. And so the question is always like, why are you doing this? If this is your grandpa, is it just like, what do you want to accomplish? Why do you know, there's a million blog posts about this in 2016, where it's like, when Donald Trump won, it's like, how do I go to Thanksgiving? How do I get through family dinner with my racist uncle? And the answer is, well, why? What do you want? Like, why? A, why go? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? And do you want to change his mind? Do you want to have your mind changed? Like, what's your real goal? And so when you have those loggerheads, this is, this is what the classic question of every, in, of every negotiation is. What's your BATNA? What is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? What happens if you don't go to Thanksgiving? What happens if you walk away from the meeting? What happens if you don't agree? Do you need this person's approval or love? If you, if you don't, then walk away, mm -hmm. right? Like James Baldwin looks at a white supremacist and he's like, I'm out of here. Like, I don't need to change your mind. I know that I'm a human being. Like, what's that conversation for? Mm -hmm. Having the, the broader conversation with society, like maybe that's worth having. Maybe he wants to have that debate. Um, I don't know if you've watched, oh man, what is it? Self-made. Have you watched Self-made? It's about, um, it's a, it's like a docudrama about the, like one of the first self-made millionaires in America. It's total feel good TV. If you need some of that right now, I forget her name, but she made this hair cream for, for black women. And, uh, she built like this empire from it. And she, uh, was talking, was it, who is it? Was it, uh, oh man, this is terrible. I'm gonna totally screw this up, but there's really no reason to look it up right now. Mrs. Perik is gonna be Googling it on the side. Oh, oh, I love this, <laughs> yeah. live notes. Um, it wasn't Adam Clayton Powell, it was earlier. It, was, was it, it wasn't Frederick Douglass, I'm blanking on his name, but there were at the time, like during restoration, the, rest, the, the, the reformation period, mm -hmm. oh man, this is terrible. This is super embarrassing. I don't know my own history, but there were, um, debates between uh white supremacists and like black intellectuals where they're like we're gonna go on stage people will buy tickets we will have this debate and people paid money to see this because it was like yeah. this is you know let's 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 then, see it happen yeah. madam cj walker yes uh, but thank you so much it's amazing she's amazing in it I mean, not, that's not the actor. That's the woman yeah. who the, the article's about. But she goes to try and get uh, like a um, uh, approval or uh, the, the imprimatur of, of a prominent uh, black intellectual at the time. And this was, this was a thing, like, let's go and watch this public debate. But I don't think there's actually enough of that these days yeah. of like, oh, well, let's, let's actually talk about why science is science. You know, because people are, would rather just have their own beliefs and go to their own corners of the internet and... But that's what it's, it's coming back to the, it almost, it's full circle, you know, to where you began. Like it's, I'm trying to think who says it, but it's, I'm in the business of, might have been a Jeff Bezos quote or it's attributed to him. I'm in the business of changing my mind. Yes. But it's like, if we were true to ourselves, most of yes. us aren't. Like, even if we believe that we've got liberal beliefs or we are open-minded to even project onto other people that, you know, they yes. don't engage in the conversation because they don't want their minds changed. The reality is we, we most of us don't, is what you're Correct. saying. Correct. The truth, we don't. But even back to the beginning, like that question there, you know, where we started was around organisations and leaders and how can they yeah. go through this. But what you've just told us is that it starts with the conversation with yourself. Like asking yeah. yourself what what will be challenged for me if I engage in this like why don't I want to go to that place yeah because what will that outcome be right and so Bezos coming with that attitude is sets the tone mm -hmm. for the whole company mm -hmm. I don't know what it's really like to work in Amazon but I I found on the internet somewhere and would love to dig it up again where there was a, a wall of this is how we talk at Amazon and this is how we don't talk at Amazon. So you talk about designing the conversation. This is the level of granularity. When somebody asks you a question, the only appropriate answers are um, yes, no, I don't know. And I will get you a number by this time. Right. So, and you say like, yeah. let's have an evidence-based mindset. 
let's have a bias towards reality. And if we don't know, let's get evidence versus let's have a circular conversation and decide based on power. One of the real challenges of coming in, in the industrial design world, the means of production are necessarily focused centrally. The decision to make a product is a big decision. Mm -hmm. It takes real investment. It's very hard to, to be, you have to be very strategic to be lean and agile in experimenting with new businesses and products when a laptop requires a factory. Mm -hmm. And a factory that makes a laptop can't necessarily make a, a handheld device overnight. So you can't, there's no, there's no, it's hard to have business agility when you're talking about atoms. Mm -hmm. And this is why people re try to rule through power. We try to guess what the future is and we want the current, the current situation to persist in the future. And of course we don't want to believe that things are going to change when our entire mortgage depends on things staying the same. Mm -hmm. And so that's why people would rather fight and hope that they're right than get evidence that they're wrong because it can jeopardize their entire worldview. And so we think like, oh man, those crazy anti-vaxxers, I am nothing like them. But it's scary to get evidence that you are wrong or that you might be wrong. It's the same thing that's hard to sit down with your best friend or your lover and say, what do you really think about me? Mm. Right? Tell me what I'm really like. Give me, tell me five words that you really, that, that you experience when you think of me. Right? It's hard to ask those questions. It's hard to say, like, what happens if this product fails? Like, how do we get it into the market in an easy way? And they're like, well, let's, but we, we might fail. Let's not do it. Mm. Right? So literally, we have the exact same mindset of, like, it might not work, so let's not try. Versus, like, well, how can we try in a way that is, makes it easier to fail? Mm. It's a hard conversation. It's retitling your book. It's the risk of not having these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> right. What happens if we don't talk? <laughs> I'd love to go to um, just, especially now. So, you know, you and I are having this conversation in this forum, which we may or may not have done anyway a number of weeks ago. What do you think about kind of this concept of there's something actually Lee Duncan from IBM said to us the other week about this oh, challenge? Lee. <laughs> a virtual IQ now, EQ, sorry, virtual yeah. EQ. Like we're gonna, we've yeah. all got our game on that. What do you think about the challenge of conversations in different mediums now? And yeah, some, totally. Like a couple of tips for people to kind of overcome some of, it's quite hard, you know, to get deep in this forum where you can't feel somebody's energy. Yeah. Or, you know, those kind of cues. Well, I question that that's true because like we've been having phone conversations with people, right? And it's like, you know, we've, we've definitely had deep voice conversations with people. It's nice to, you know, call your mother, call your grandmother, catch up. Like they tell you a story, you feel something. And that's because the, the, there's focus on one thing. And so right now I'm just focusing on you. I could have this set up so that there's a gallery view in Zoom so that you, me, and Parika are all the same size. Mm. That would be nuts because I don't need to be looking at myself. Mm. Um, generally, what I suggest to people is that they hide their self view, which is a thing you can do in Zoom, right? Uh, in Google Meet, for example, it's less of an issue because they don't have the, you kind of just look at the one speaker at a time, but I've intentionally pinned your video and I'm watching you, I'm reading you, yeah. I'm empathizing with you, I'm connecting with your emotions. And so I think it's, it's, um, it just takes a little bit of effort. Mm -hmm. Hiding your, if you're using Zoom a lot, hide your self-view. Check your hair, check your lighting, and then turn <laughs> off your self-view. Um, working attention is about 120 bits per second. Mm -hmm. And one person talking is about 60 bits per second. So that's why I think voice conversations are so powerful because we're literally using half of our attention to focus 100% on their voice. And then you kind of just like, I don't know if you do this, like you kind of just walk around the house, you know, and, and, you know, and if you walk with somebody on the beach and you have a conversation, there's this act of, you know, we're standing, sitting in front of a fire. There's this meditative visual that's happening that sort of like, it, 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 
it engages your other senses, but not fully. Zoom can be that way. I'm just focusing on you right now. I'm not really looking at myself at all, but a lot of times people just take the gallery view for, for granted and they're like, oh wow, it's so busy. And I, you're, you can't help but check yourself out mm -hmm. when you see your picture. I, I assume this is not just me. When I walk by a shop window, you're like, you just check, you know, how's my hair, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're doing this constantly on Zoom. Uh, so it's, it's, and I think it's, it's sapping some of our energy, mm -hmm. like our working, our working attention. Mm -hmm. Some of it is going towards listening to the person and some of it is going towards occasionally checking ourselves out. And so it's really about controlling attention. Mm -hmm. And if at some point we need to go onto a mural and do some work together, we should do that. And let's not worry about the video channel. Let's, let's put it in the background, mm -hmm. but we need to start start in gallery view, see everybody, connect with everybody, check in. It's not hard to do to connect with people and then pin the person who's talking and then go look at something together, like walking on the beach or standing in front of a fireplace. Mm -hmm. Get into that meditative state where you're, you have a shared third point for the conversation. Don't just have a convert. Don't just like have a meeting where you're having a bunch of decisions. We play all these games in facilitation training and in workshops in general, where we play like rock, paper, scissors tournaments and count to count to 10 as a group. And if you try those online, you, you'll start to realize how absurdly hard it is because there's no turn taking cues. There's no head of the table. So we can't look to the head of the table for what should be said next. We can't look at each other and go around in a circle. Let's go around the circle and blah, blah, blah. So regulating and controlling turn-taking. Turn-taking is one of the com components of the conversation OS, like clarifying who gets to speak when. If it's one facilitator who says, okay, raise your hand, I'll take you off mute. Cool, that's fine, that's super boring mm -hmm. and that's super controlling. What if, as I do in my check-ins, one person says something and they choose the next person who, who says something and then we all say something. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets to say something. Let's demonstrate the idea that everyone who is in the meeting has a worthwhile opinion and let's make airtime for everyone to say something and let's give them a specific amount of time to do it in. It's like, uh, sometimes I feel like it's shocking to me that I have to explain these things to people. I have a facilitation masterclass where we go through all these weeks and you know, some of it is these tricks and tips and others like just the feel of the elasticity of this space. And so it's not just the EQ, it's like, getting used to the fact that when um, 200 milliseconds is the average pause. And if it's more than 200 milliseconds, it feels like, wait, what are they saying? Like, why aren't they responding to what I've said? Online pauses are much longer. And here's the joke. It takes us about 600 milliseconds to form a sentence. And so like, if you stop talking, and then 200 milliseconds later, I start saying something. That means I have been formulating what I was thinking well into, like I was only listening to some of what you were saying. And so either I'm starting with a bunch of ums and ahs and not really saying anything that's well thought and I'm trying to like throw something together like on the fly, or I wasn't listening to you for the last at least 400 milliseconds. And so there's two things. One, welcome longer pauses. Online requires longer pauses because we can't hear each other. Like, oh, did, did you know, oh, who, did somebody say something? Okay, wait, let's, wait, who's unmuted? Like, we don't actually know who's saying what, when. So it's okay to have longer pauses. And two, give people time to think. This was always a good idea in in-person facilitation, in-person meetings. Like, hey, everyone, here's the issue. Everyone take two minutes and write down what you think, and then we'll put it someplace and then talk about it. Mm -hmm right? Have an honest record of everyone's thoughts on the matter before we start uh, cross-fertilizing our opinions uh, amongst each other. Like, do that. Let everyone think their thoughts, put them in some place, and then have everyone read everyone's thoughts and then have a conversation. That's just best practice. But it's even more important to have the best practices uh, here in this, this internet place because it's floofier. It's more elastic. When I put stuff in, people into a breakout room and I bring them back, some of them might come immediately back because they've clicked on the button and they come back immediately. And some people might wait until the room closes a minute later. So we're just going to all be in a room 
for a minute where some people are there and some people aren't. That's just okay, right? I think it stresses some people out, but it's just online conversations, I think, are just a little bit more elastic. It's like it takes a while to send people to a room and it takes them a while to come back. We're not frustrated by that in the real world. Somehow we're frustrated by that on the internet. There's, there, it's not immediate. We expect the internet to be like completely immediate, but it's not. That's actually such a good point as well. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about this one. You would think about, you would move people. I've never really thought about like, you know, you, people would meander in, you know, half of them would come back. Some of them would have gone to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. like, oh, I guess we're taking a bio break now. Okay, let's let's come, let's everyone, let's reconvene in ten. All right. Yeah, and that's perfectly <laughs> fine. And then it's you know this kind of in these Zoom rooms where like countdown, you've got five, four, three, you know, come back in. Yeah. Boom, we're on again. But yeah. We got to get better at some of that stuff. Well, it's better. also hard because we 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 have less time now. Yeah. Right, because we your kids are home, and. We've got so many meetings, all of the meetings are happening. And so we're trying to do stuff in a ridiculous amount of time. Mm -hmm. I've worked with companies where they're like, can we fix our meeting culture and our meeting system? I'm like, well, let's talk about what you're doing. And it's like, they're having having 30 back to back 30 minute meetings Mm -hmm. and there's no time to prep for them. I'm like, it's almost impossible to facilitate back to back 30 minute meetings and have them be effective when they all start five minutes late. Mm -hmm. So they're actually not 30 minute meetings. They're 20 minute meetings. (laughs) <laughs> in terms of like, in there, I, where am I? What is this? Yeah, thing? yeah. There's five minutes lost on either end, at least. People shuffling and getting into place and putting their books down, and you know, yeah. it takes. It's it's non-trivial. Yeah. I want to. We we have hit nine o'clock, so if people who are live have got to jump off. Absolutely fine. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, I'd love to just do a couple of quick fire questions if we could. Would that be okay, Daniel? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Can you see what I can, how I can do. Yeah. What is one behavior or habit that has really improved your work? Oh, wow. Um, I always like to give a shout out to uh, Cave Day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cave Day was started by uh, actually my first cousin, Jeremy, and uh, two other lovely people, my my friend uh, Molly and, oh my God, Jake. Yeah. I was blanking on his name for a second. Uh, Cave Day is this idea of deep work Mm -hmm. and it's a structure and a community around deep work. And so it started several years ago as a um, one Sunday a month, we would get together. It was like 40 people. I remember the first one got into a big circle. We'd say, what are you working on? What percentage are you done? And uh, you'd just sit down and you'd work with 40 other people. And I don't know if you've ever meditated with a group of people where you kind of go deeper because there's just this group field. I don't know what it is. I don't want to be woo woo, but it's kind of like, oh, wow. Cause if you pop out, everybody's in it. And so you just get back into it. And if you've ever done the Pomodoro technique, mm-hmm. you know, where you're like, okay, I'm going to focus for 25 minutes and then I'm going to take a five minute break. Cave day was like someone else is keeping time and they would stretch out the time more and more. And cave day made it possible for me to write my book. Mm-hmm. Both of them. I would never would have made the card for the time out because they started doing weekday caves and so it would be like, all right, people, I would just block off Wednesday morning, mm-hmm. 9.30 to 1. And if somebody tried to have a meeting with me, I'd be like, oh, no, I'm, I'm booked. Mm-hmm. Right? Whereas normally if they're like, okay, so I'm just going to be working on some stuff for myself. And if somebody, one of your clients says, oh, can we have a, meet, have a meeting? You're like, okay. And then suddenly your calendar is just a wreck. And you don't, have, you don't protect any of your genius creative time. And so cave day is... Is a, is a mechanism for getting deep work into your life. Highly recommend it. You don't obviously need to sign up for Cave Day to do it. Um, yeah. Making and protecting that cave, that, that, that deep work, this idea of being in the cave and, and, and having that time for yourself, so powerful. Cave Day, we've got it down. Okay, so yeah. what, next one, what are we not looking at that we should be? What are we not looking at that we should be? I mean, obviously conversations, right? I think we're having them, but we're not realizing we're having them. My friend Abby, who wrote How to Make Sense of Any Mess, she wrote a really nice blurb and it really warmed my heart because she was like, if you think that just because we're human, that we're, we know how to have conversations naturally, 
then like you are missing out on an opportunity to be mindful and intentional about them. So I, I, I obviously have to say like, we're not, we're not being mindful and intentional enough in our communication and realizing what we can, how we,